Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production. Now, Simon Baxter would love this. This would be his idea of utter, complete bliss. The woodland photographer I'm talking about. I know that, Neil. I've listened to that show. Oh, sorry. I'm walking away from the road into the uh, into some lovely, mature woodland. I, I drove... Must be about eight, nine miles west for my photo walk today. I was heading toward one particular forest and, um, and I came across this. Happy accidents, I, I suppose. But let me get a, a quick picture before we go any further, just so you can see what, I, what I'm seeing at the start of today's photo walk show. I'm back with my trusty 28mm Yashica vintage lens on my X-Pro1. Uh, using uh, focus peaking, so I'm not I'm not with a wide angle today. I thought I've been a bit wide angle tastic the last couple of weeks. Here we go, sixtieth of a second. It's reasonably dark in the woods. Uh, what are we on f4? ISO 400. There we go. A scrapbook image to uh, to start the day. Now can I just say before we start, thank you to those who sent in birthday wishes for last week. Very kind of you. I am one year older but sadly, not wiser. When is the wiser thing supposed to kick in? Really? Anyway, age today plays, um, plays a bit of a theme. I think I received um, a collector's edition book from the National Portrait Gallery for my birthday called Hold Still, a portrait of our nation, meaning the UK in this particular case, from 2020, but with uh, familiar scenes to to wherever you lived in the world in in some respects anyway um, 31,000 pictures were sent in from all over this country to show life in lockdown amateurs pros all ages all abilities and the selected are an incredible volume of the most emotional funny serious sad artistic I could go on pictures but I say collector's edition uh, because the binding process went wrong and the pages have been bound wrong way up. Or is it that the cover is, is the wrong way up and the page... Oh, you know what I mean. Anyways, I'll feature the book very soon. I'm, I'm wondering whether to try and get in touch with some of the photographers featured within it and do a kind of uh, a sort of medley, really, of their experiences. And we don't just throw this thing together. Talking of experience, today's guests are all about experience life experience and how they've turned that or are turning um, that into a photographic experience now and i think or i hope that uh, today's show is the ultimate inspiration for anyone who's thought hmm, you know what that photo thing i wonder if i've got it in me to dot 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 miranda remington an American photographer who had to put her life plans on hold photographically and, and creatively to, uh, to bring up and care for her autistic son. And that would have been in her, her 20s. Now 50, she's, uh, she's seemingly flicked a creative switch and light is literally flooding into her lens in a way that I thought uh, you'd love to hear about. And then slightly further down the creative process, I suppose, if you want to add the label, the professional creative process, a guest who, uh, who Kev spoke to on uh, the other podcast I'm a, I'm a part of, a reprobate mate Mullins. But uh, this time it's, it's me talking with her. We, we all bring something different to the party after all. And uh, it completely suits today's theme. Sandra Catania Ordorno, a Brazilian photographer who in her 60s found photography completely by chance. But it's a, it's a happy accident that's led to several published books internationally, proving that uh, this thing we do, this picture making that we love so much, has nothing to do with age or, or wealth or education or any of those things, but everything to do with opening our eyes. Like somebody's just turned our, our dial to, to the bulb setting and said, well now, would you look at this? Today on The Photo Walk. It's amazing. It's the greatest gift that I could ever. Yeah. And, and without even expecting it at 60. Yeah. And it's easy. I just get the camera and go everywhere with it. I could have died without finding out. Yeah. So 
all of us maybe have something that we, if we don't explore, we won't find out. Two stories today that I think each should have individual charm and inspiration. One photographer coming back to a life's love of creating and another who's just discovered the sincere joy of recording life with a camera. It's the only photography show like this in the podcast sphere and you are part of it where I invite you to walk with me just out cameras, taking along your letters, your DMs, your Facebook messages, lots of them, lots of creative insight. And then, of course, our special guests, too. Also, we'll be hearing from former guests with snippets of inspiration. Valerie Jardin on hosting what makes you happy. Scott Goldsmith on having an eye for a story. And Mandy Burton on talking to strangers and asking them for portraits. I'll tell you more about what we're also talking about from your letters in a moment. We're supported by our friends, of course, at mpb.com, the number one platform in the UK, the US and Europe when it comes to buying, trading or selling quality used kit online. And very soon, I'm actually going to Brighton, one of the warehouses, to really, well, to meet the people that have so much passion for helping you change kit. And this month has all been about changing Understanding a moment can change the way we feel, and mpb.com puts photo and video kit into more hands, more sustainably, helping you to change kit to tell your stories and what you see and, of course, feel. MPB gives you affordable access to kit that doesn't cost the earth, so sell the kit you're not using through them, trade it in for the kit you really would like to create, buy used, spend less, and get more go to mpb.com. We're also supported by our amazing patrons who help glue this show together every single week, who from the price of a one high street coffee per month are each and every one helping to, to build this show so it can continue in its mission to become a, a super diverse community of photographers from every interest, every genre and every level of competence helping to guide and support and mentor photographers worldwide. So... On the show today, a heartwarming story from Canada land. Some hearty news to start the day. God knows we need some, some of that kind of news right now in our lives, don't we? I have a question. I absolutely need you to, well, help me unpick and understand. It's a problem a few of our listeners have written in about, one in particular today. But it's a subject I'm having personal difficulty with and I've decided to share because I know you will have something important to say about it. We talk about monochrome, the power of black and white for our minds, as much as the presentation and love of it. Is story overused? Oh yes, it's the gift of a subject that keeps on giving that one, though our patron of the day may have solved it at last. Your photo walk pictures and an exhibition to tell you about right at the close. Lots and lots to share and talk about today. But right now we should walk and it's a windy one today, so uh, wrap up warm. Coffee and Garibaldi is packed, oh definitely. Boots on, check. Spare batteries, cards, film, check. Earbuds in, check. Lens caps off. Yep, let's walk. I've got a feeling that uh, this week's, this week's programme, as I've chosen Woodland, the peace and tranquility of, is probably going to sound more like uh, the be by the coast than last week's show when when we were in the mist did you enjoy that by the way the the adventure uh, because it was so quiet wasn't it the coast was eerily silent through that fog uh, and uh, i was thinking please well there were a few goals here and there i managed to find a few but on the whole everything sort of hid away it was almost like the, we're, we're hiding from the fog and it was it was eerily silent at stages but today i'm stood in woodland there's quite a another reason for standing in the woodland today was it's really windy so going out on one of my high heathland kind of walks would just not have been appropriate all you all you'd have heard through the microphone is 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 gusting wind and white noise but uh, today it's going to sound like i'm by the coast because you just hear this from the trees it's fantastic woodland i'm trying to find let me go find some bird life because I, I do like you to feel <laughs> like you are actually out and about with me and if it's too quiet right i'm having to walk through see now i'm, I'm taking this thing to heart that simon baxter talked about the understory do you remember 
when you when you make pictures in woodland try not to disturb too much not uh well so that somebody couldn't they could probably easily easily track me i'm sure they knew what they were doing but uh try not to try not to leave tracks that's what he said wasn't it and over here i think is where all the bird the bird folk are hanging out it's nice to be serenaded while i'm talking to you right i'm starting this week with the most heartwarming story from beautiful canada land and uh, it's a it's a letter from our good friend and photographer eric delorme it's uh, it was one of the it was one of the really early photo walk episodes that i remember reading a mail from from eric uh, on and it became a, a really important letter that i i think he didn't even realize himself uh, would inspire this show in many respects because um it said to me, and I don't think I've ever told you this, Eric, that we are a community, that we look out for each other. And I w- always wanted this podcast to, to become a community. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's there, isn't it? And it's gradually, it's gradually getting, you know, more there. <laughs> Does that make sense? Not at all, Neil. Oh, sorry. Um, but, um, yeah, we are a community. And I, I think we can share our, our wonderful pictures and also enjoy some of those vulnerabilities that we have because we're human. I remember being at the top of a hill reading his letter in the sunshine. I really do. That letter, that original letter that I'm going to recount, that was, um, I remember. I can see, where, where was, well, I, I can't think where I was, but I know that in front of me, I can see it. There was a long, I made a picture of it. There was a long, long fence. There was a kind of vanishing point fence running away from me. It was a... It was a glorious day. I'm going to have to step round this. There's a big spider there. And it's not that I'm afraid of the spider. It's more that um, I'm taking that don't destroy habitat to heart thing. That's your house, Mr. Spider. You don't want me to come waltzing through it. There we go. That's better. Yeah, so I remember that sort of vanishing point um, uh, fence. I definitely remember that. I was up the top of a hill. I was looking down. Oh, that's right. I was looking down into into the industrial part of, of Newbury, close to where I live. And I just, I remember reading your letter. It was a warm day, T-shirt on. And, and so that letter from him, he was on one of his, his walks. He had just been for a, a biopsy, but treated himself on the same day to a, to a new lens. I think, I think, it was a, there's lots of I thinks going on here, 10 to 24 millimeter Fuji lens. Anyway, it was a new lens to make up for a less than comfortable first part of the day having that uh, that biopsy and so that was it really I, I remember the letter you sent and uh, and the missive if you like that started all this because it was the very next letter when Eric announced that he was starting chemotherapy that really that uh, that story that we've you know, from time to time kept you up up to date with where that started uh, and over the last year, we've had updates and um, wonderful, wonderful pictures from time to time when Eric's been feeling up to it, uh, when he's felt that he can go out photo walking. Clearly, during this particular time of our history as well, he's had to be careful about taking himself too close to, to folk. Uh, and then I've, I received this latest letter today from, from Eric. Uh, so the, this is the latest mail that I'd like to share with you as, as this sort of community of photo walkers that we are together. Eric says, well, well, this past Friday, I went to the hospital to discuss the results of my post-treatment CT scans and blood work with my haematologist. The long and short of it is, Neil, I'm officially in remission. The scans came back clean or as clean as can be expected for an incurable form of cancer, and everything is looking up. My immune system is still rebuilding. Chemo did a number on that, he says. And I must still be very careful in this lovely COVID world of ours, but um, I should be in the all clear come Christmas or so. My appointment was in the early afternoon and I wasn't going to go back to work after that. It was too nice a day to do that. 23 degrees, calm winds, no clouds, Indian summer at its finest. So I went for a photo walk. Not wanting to drive too far, I ventured about a kilometre and a half west of the hospital and wandered around the Rideau Gardens neighbourhood an older established neighborhood with very majestic, very mature, very colorful trees. There's nothing like a Canadian autumn. I'm sure there isn't, Eric. It was just the right kind of place to walk around and clear the anxiety 
from my mind, and I dare say, actually, celebrate as well. I was listening to uh, episode 262, he says, with uh, Valerie Jardin, and it was like listening to two old friends having a chat. Very comforting. I do like, uh, I do take a little issue, he said, with Valerie's stance on post-processing, though I personally love post-processing. Oh, yes, Valerie uh, did have a, I'm not going to say laissez-faire approach to, to retouch, because that's not fair. No, it's, it's, um, it's that she doesn't do much. Simple as, really. I personally, he says, love post-processing. I find it as much fun as the image-making process, so I won't abide with, with her five-second rule, although I, I do try hard to avoid rolling my turds in glitter. <laughs> um, well, without context, that rather colloquial reference is like somebody surprising you, I don't know, with a, with a Mets flash gun. Bang! Um, so you'll just have to go back to, uh, to 262 and listen to that so, so you understand what Valerie was saying. Anyway, says Eric, cheers. We, uh, we had Thanksgiving not so long ago in Canada. We celebrate it earlier than the next door. Must be something about the timing of the harvest. I guess I actually have something to give thanks for this year. Well, you most certainly do, Eric. You most certainly do. And uh, I've included a link to that full walk on his blog in today's show notes, uh, which has pictures and a narrative, of course, uh, to read as well. And I'm sure everyone will echo this, Eric, when I say, Eric, it's fantastic news. It really is. And uh, you know what? As you get out, and I know you're part of the world because I've seen those photographs before from you, as you get out in those snows, that deep winter that you have, I'm really looking forward to seeing the images, those excitable images that you're going to, to record. I tell you what, I'm going, to make a, I'm going to make an Eric picture. What's an Eric picture, Neil? Well, it's um, hopefully a moment that I can remember getting this letter from Eric, the, the good news one. Uh, there's a clearing here. So that sort of... Oh, don't go getting poetic now, Neil. Oh, I'll try not to. Uh, but it does sort of signify some kind of, I don't know, clearing of the air. Neil, you said you weren't going to get poetic. No, I, I, I mean it. Look, there's a clearing there. In it, there's this beautiful, this moss-covered tree. I have no idea what the tree is. Uh, I did, you know, funnily enough, I did look the other day for, um, for one of these spotter guides so that I could uh, start to recognise trees so that as I'm walking around I could say oh yeah there's an ash there's a birch there's a beach but uh, anyway there's a clearing there this is going to be my Eric photo so how can I compose this well I'm going to go because it's uh, I'm trying to get the the reach of the tree so it's going to have to be a portrait photograph so this week uh, and th this is one of the reasons why by the way why I can light box some of the posts that we have and some of them I can't. I can't really light box them if they're all different orientations because of the way that uh, the website works. But I can put it in as a carousel picture within the collection of images that I make today on my photo walk. So here we go. We've got uh, one two fifth uh, F. I'm going to have to open up actually F two eight because I'm on ISO four hundred. And uh, here we go. That is my Eric picture. Nowhere near as good as the ones you've sent in that I want you to see on the show page today. But uh, look, some sunshine's come out for you as well, just at the right moment. And I tell you what, while I do a little celebratory quiet whoop, let's hear something from my guest Valerie Jardin uh, from uh, 262 a couple of weeks ago that you mentioned, Eric. Here she is talking about making pictures that really mean something to you. Not making them for social, no. But, but making them because they just felt right and good at the time. You should always post what makes you happy and not post for the likes. Just uh, be true to yourself. How many times have I looked at a photographer's portfolio and then there is one photograph that is in motion blur or it may not even be on purpose, but it's just slightly blurred and they go really quickly through it i'm like wait 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 wait, Shh, what was that and they said oh yeah well that's out of focus i'm like this has so much soul and so much emotion and in in your day's work or in your week's work this is 
this is definitely the shot that stands out the most. But people are so afraid, so afraid of the pixel peepers out there who are going to say, well, that's not sharp or this or that. So just detach yourself to those people. That's that's my that's that's my advice, because ultimately, unless you're working for a client, but ultimately, as a documentary photographer, you are the only person you need to please with your work. Yeah. And keep that in mind at all times. You are the only person you need to please. Valerie Jardin. And uh, expect to hear more Valerie as the months pass. It was such an inspiring chat. And I'm so pleased that, uh, Eric, you called it um, like a friend a friendly chat or chat amongst friends that was it because uh, that's what it felt like to me at the time and uh, I've, uh, I've subsequently written a little bit to, to Valerie she I think she's st- is she still on the course in France <laughs> I'm asking you like you're going to say yeah I think she is Neil um, but she's uh, been doing a street photography course in, in Paris um, and I did suggest to her that uh, when she goes around the world doing her courses maybe we could check in for, for some little 15-minute updates just to see what she'd been doing, what exercises she was setting and stuff like that. Does that seem like a good idea? Look, the sun's really streaming now. And I'm going to have to do another one of these, of these pictures to show the sun just kissing on one side the trees and on the other side it just falls into darkness. Hold on. So I think, actually, this is going to be another portrait one. Maybe, you know, I will end up light boxing these ones today within the show page because uh, they're all ending up as portrait pictures portrait orientated pictures one two fifth f8 iso 400 my trusty x pro one my fujifilm x pro one with a vintage lens let's uh oh look at that love it it did look like this morning it was going to be a particularly rainy walk in fact the kids hoodwinked me into a into a, a lift to school. Dad, it's raining. No, it's not really raining. Yeah, it is. Can't walk in this. Might shrink. Or excuses thereof. So soft. My mum and dad used to say to me, no, go on, get out. There's a raincoat. Cost us a fortune. Wear it. Want to see it being used. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, they do hoodwink me. I can see it coming, but they just do it every single time. Dad. Our homework will get wet. Oh, there we go. There's an excuse. Never mind the homework was eaten by my dog. The homework was going to get wet. I see your plan, boys. Well, it seems that uh, Valerie Jardin's chat with me raised uh, a few thoughts, including this from another, a good friend of the show, Mark Zilberman. And uh, I'll admit to feeling a a tad nervous about this one. I'm in... uh, Uh, sort of reticence mode to a degree because it's such a difficult subject to discuss without understandably raising a level of debate that's um well it's a tightrope walk and uh because it it questions um society the role of social media the very real aspect of how men and women uh can or or maybe sometimes forced with a small f that is to to think differently about how they make pictures and uh, in this context well this one is about making pictures making pictures on the street i'd uh, I'd suggested to valerie that uh, i was now feeling sometimes uh well a tad awkward actually about making any pictures on the street that involve children in any way shape or form Uh, and you know even at weddings too uh, where where you know, I'm practically expected to make pictures of kids being kids. You, know, you, you always, somebody will always tug you on the arm at one stage and say, "Oh, look over there, mate! You're missing that." And the kids are playing. They think, "Yeah, I've got that. Now I got that five minutes ago." But I've started to feel just, just a tad nervous uh, about that, um, mainly because now I, I didn't really mention this to Valerie, and I wish I had. That um, I had a parent who asked me for my for my Facebook account when I was working at a wedding, which, uh, which I, I later learned from the groom was so that uh, they could ensure their children's pictures from the wedding didn't show up on, on my Facebook, which left me feeling really uncomfortable, almost like I was being accused of something just rather grubby or, a, or dare I say, a crime that I hadn't or wasn't about to, to, to do I just, just it was I don't know it left me frankly confused and very conflicted and uh, I wondered uh, at, at mealtime that day I wonder I thought is it my appearance is it um, is it the middle-aged man with with, with grey beard look 
that works so well for Hollywood stars, but not necessarily for me. Is that the issue? So anyway, there's the context. And here's the mail I received from Mark. Hi, Neil. I was listening to your interview with Valerie Jardin. I'm very pleased you brought up the matter of men and women shooting street and documentary photography. Although I did think her response gave short shrift to the issue. I've heard Jeff Mermelstein say in a recent interview that he finds it very difficult shooting now as he is uh, a male in his 60s. Just for, for context, I'm sure you know this, but uh, he is, uh, Jeff is a celebrated photojournalist uh, based out of New York. Oh, just being bathed in the sunshine. Where did this come from? Mark writes, I had my own miserable experience in the last week. I was in my local park across the street from where I've lived for 20 years. They were holding the annual county carnival there. I was moving about, I was shooting some random pictures. I made one quick shot of a teenager who, if it's contextually important here, I might add in brackets, was bigger than Mark, he says. This lad ran to his father, which resulted in the father approaching me, says Mark aggressively, demanding I erase the pictures. Frankly, I almost never refused to do this. But before I could get to do it, he said he would talk to the police. Now, something occurs to me there, Mark, because it seems that you've been asked to do that before. So I'm wondering if it's a, a shooting style. Oh, don't get, don't get angsty with me. But I'm wondering because other photographers I talk to, and I'll, I'll include my, my good reprobate buddy Mullins in this, have said that they've... And I think Valerie said as well that they very, very, very rarely, maybe once or twice in their entire photographic experience, have been asked to actually delete something. Anyway, that's just a by the by. So off this chap goes, and Mark can see this man talking to the police. And obviously he's now got that uncomfortable feeling because they're both looking towards Mark as he's making his pictures at this at this uh, county event. I waved my hand, he says, to let them know where I was. Long story short, the police came over, asked if I, I took the picture. I said yes. He said, you didn't ask permission. I said, I, I didn't think I needed to. He said, you don't have a permit. I said, I didn't need that. It's public property. This isn't for advertising. He demanded my ID. I've since learned that that was against the law too. I gave it to him though. Of course, there was nothing on it. I suppose you mean because we don't have those sort of documents in this country, but I, I guess what does that mean? That it shows if you've got past record or something. Anyway, he said that uh, I was going to delete the picture in front of the guy or he, and I don't know whether you mean the policeman or the, the man that was complaining, was going to make a big deal out of this. I complied, but I've since learned that I should say nothing really. Ask if I'm under arrest. If so, what for? If not, just walk away. So the long and short of this is that Mark is now questioning that uh, if he had been a woman, and this is where I feel in, you, you know, that, that uh, air of discomfort that I was talking about, would this perhaps not have happened? Is it our appearance? Is it an issue in the way that we, we present ourselves? And would the father have behaved the same way against a female photographer? So that, that's the issue here, and, and that, that's what I really need you to help me unpick. I really do, if you could. Um, so you can probably understand my uneasiness here with the subject because it raises as many questions as thoughts, doesn't it? From how is the photographer supposed to act on the street? Do you make it obvious that uh, you, know, you are making pictures, whether you're he or she? Do you ask permission for every single scenario, which of course is clearly tricky if you, you consider how documentary and decisive moment stuff works? So there we go, <laughs> lots and lots of questions. I don't have all the answers, so I'm kind of handing the baton over to you. So thank you, Mark. I do think this is a fascinating subject and one that's probably a long road with, with, with seemingly uh, no ending, covered with eggshells to encounter. So uh, I, I do need your help with this and the questions I have are as much to try and help me unpick my role in, in photographing myself on the, on the streets. And actually, I do have another couple of things or thoughts on this it has social media shaped this because i think online has has kind of in some respects has, has hijacked innocence and actually also meant that we have a a scenario where folk have become self-appointed analysts in identifying who they believe to be wayward souls i mean this this chap clearly had a problem with mark 
and uh, it, it's that sort of that little bit of knowledge on the subject that makes you a dangerous armchair expert, isn't it? Or indeed, adding two and two together to make a figure that's nowhere near the right answer. A bit like my accounting. <laughs> but the, the flip side is that online behaviour and social media can shift in its seat a little bit uncomfortably here for a moment. All right, Neil, don't give us too hard a time. Well, it's, I think it's unveiled pretty loose morals and provided a, a grubby hiding place for a minority who have, as ever, created a real issue for, for the majority. So your thoughts, please. I'm turning this over to you now. I really am. Right. Time for an inspirational clip, I think. I'm, I'm going to choose, very timely, yes. I'm going to choose one from a photographer I spoke with a long time back, Mandy Burton, who made a project where she needed to ask complete strangers for a portrait with their dog. So yes, the dynamic is completely different here. I accept that, but I do really love the approach that Mandy has and how she has had to find her own level of courage to walk up to complete strangers and uh, ask for a portrait. Well, I, I usually approach them. Obviously, I'm on my bike and I'll break and they'll just look at me like, what are you doing? And, um, and, and I'll just say, oh, your dog's really cute. And this is like straight from the heart because I can't resist them. Dogs dogs give, my, give me my courage. Mm. So I'll stop and then I'll, I'll just chat about their dog. Uh, and then um, I'll say, um, I, actually, I'm doing a, a photography project. Would it be possible to take your picture? And I've only had in the whole, I mean, I must have asked what I'm on. I'm a new project, I'm on about number 38. So in about the 138 people, I've probably had about four or five say no. And there were genuine wow. reasons, like um, somebody had just uh, lost a dog in the family, so they were quite upset. But I've since taken their picture in the new project, but I bumped into them by accident. It's the Friday photo walk. Just you, just I, just me, just I, with our cameras, making some pictures, having a chat as we go along, reading the letters out of the mailbag can't remember who it was but somebody dm'd me oh who was it earlier during the week sorry i will properly credit you um later on probably in the middle of the night i'll phone you up and say i've just remembered who you were um saying uh, they like they liked my old-fashioned language letter yes i've started using letter more haven't i and record when we talk about the song at the uh, at the end of the show yeah i like those words letters records they're not old-fashioned Vintage is back in, haven't you heard? Anyway, thank you to Mandy, Mandy Burton, who you heard just then. Now, I want to take a scoot through our wonderful Facebook group in a moment, as we didn't actually do that last week, did we? I don't think so. And we have some incredible members, and a good few of you have gone on to become patrons too, which I, I sincerely appreciate, I really do. So this, uh, this photo walk show really relies upon you to send the pictures in that you make on your own walks and the, and the messages and the stories you send in, which can be anything loosely to do with photography and art and, and filmmaking and of, course, and, of course, mindfulness, since uh, that is such an important part of what we do when we, we make our pictures. So keep sending any photo stuff, any inspirational thoughts and questions that you have may be a, a good talking point, such as Mark's a moment ago, which I, I sincerely hope has sort of um, greased the wheels of activity with you, where you think, oh, I just need to say something about that. Uh, and your pictures to inspire a community of photographers across the globe and send them to the email address, which is studio at photographydaily.show studio at photography daily dot show 2000 pixels that this is really important actually because i've been receiving quite a few pictures of late and i know sometimes email does it doesn't it or some there's some programs that seem to do this where you have sent at 2000 pixels and they suddenly resize themselves down to i don't know 460 which is not conducive to showing on the the show page which i really want to do with your images so 2000 pixels on the long side uh, and that's the same by the way email address by the way uh, to send in your, your 365, Community 365 pictures, which, uh, oh, it's been growing in strength. And my thanks to those that are taking part. I, uh, there is a, a, you know, a jump for joy within me every time I see one of those, an email notification pop up with 365 in the subject box. There really is. So then, the Facebook group. If you haven't joined us yet, we're at 
We're a friendly bunch. I have to admit, I've not been in the last couple of weeks as much as usual because uh, just, I don't know, every, lots of things to do, some things to announce to you soon as well. Um, some interviews, a special interview, lots of editing. But uh, I do try to pop in there myself and get, in, get involved because it's a very friendly place, very safe place where people feel they can discuss photography and ask questions without somebody saying, don't you know the answer to that? And if that does happen, we, uh, we very, well, Neil, Neil Ford, um, a wonderful administrator, moderator, um, traffic warden of, of Facebook, <laughs> he, uh, sorry, Neil, he, um, he, he jumps in there and make sure that we're all playing nice, which is, which is important. Here's one from Trev Packer then in the Facebook group. And I think Trev hits the nail on the head when it comes to posting for posting's sake on social media. That thing that Valerie was mentioning earlier on. He talks here about posting because you have something you want to share that makes you feel something. And, uh, and this is a, a real balancing act, isn't it, for, for some people? Because commercially, if you're a commercial photographer, you sort of rely upon... Oh, I'm just out in this lovely, huge, wide field here. Expansive field. It's all broken out the other side of the woods. Yes, if you're, a, if you're using Instagram commercially, then you may need to post stuff that, that shows what you do alongside stuff that shows how you feel. But sometimes you can. I, I don't know. I think you can get caught up in the, in the game of feeding the machine. And um, I have an email also today on that, on that subject of feeding the machine. We'll get to that. Anyways, Trev. Trev, yes. Trev from our Facebook group. Hi all, for a while I was stuck in a rut with my photography, posting irrelevant photos that had no context, just like firing a revolver from the hip but missing my brief in mind. Only now have I begun to find my comfy spot on the, the sofa of photography. I quite like that. I found monochrome to be just the antidote that I need, finding colour to be distracting and sometimes frustrating. Uh, Trev says, uh, I have depression. And seeing in monochrome has soothed and helped my mind reignite again. He was interested. Has anyone had similar experiences and rebounded from their love of taking images again? This title, uh, he popped this on the, on the Facebook page, but I'm going to put it on the show page today so you can see it. It's the first one in a series of three that he sent in so I could, uh, I, I could pop them up there. He says, this image is, uh, is titled, I Dream in Mono. Um, be interested to receive your thoughts on on what Trev says. So, thank you for for your um, for your message there on the Facebook group. And that's interesting, isn't it? So, sort of decluttering your mind with monochrome images. So, to uh, to our guest. Well, we have two guests today, and we're starting with a uh, well, a creative and a photographer and a writer, suggested by somebody you'll be very familiar with, um, our friend of the show. And the man behind my 28mm vintage lens, the gift that never stops giving, Tim Binder. Uh, um, uh, I was going to say fan. I'm going to use fan in the correct context of the word. Somebody, you know, you admire very much. who is a, a fan of Miranda Remington, who's um, an American photographer. And, uh, it's a, and this is a little different in that I'm talking here with, uh, with a photographer who hasn't necessarily got a book out. Well, she hasn't got a book out yet. Um, or a particular project that's that's published at the moment, or is necessarily famous with you know, within photographic circles. But but she has captured the heart and imagination of a growing number of followers, just like Tim, who are who are fascinated by her story and enveloped in her or by her photography. So some backstory I think is important. Miranda essentially quit her life in uh, advertising photography creativity to care for her son who was diagnosed with autism and and it wasn't a, a do slightly less of it scenario it, it was a real down tools and zip lock that side of my life thing but then um, aged in her 50s a chance to to pick up camera and pen happened again because this is a story about writing as well it came it came her way along with the opportunity to do a bit more traveling make some stories and then find a bolt hole next to the beach. This is the wonderful bit to soul search and piece all this stuff together and perhaps, perhaps make that book. So it's, it's different, very different, really, this story to my second guest who has now made 
her book and more and intends to uh, actually keep publishing internationally. But for the moment, uh, for this chapter one of the interviews today, I'd like you to meet photographer and writer Miranda Remington. Miranda, we'll get to your early story in a moment, but I, I did read in your Insta feed that you'd taken your car, Jeepsy has a name, uh, to, a, to a place called Morrow Bay earlier this year. As you said, I'm in the early stages of a few promising project ideas that require stability the road can't offer. So I'm renting a cottage near the ocean starting August 1st in Morrow Bay, coastal town a few hours north of LA that holds a very special meaning to me. Did, did you find the piece you needed for your projects? You know, my grandparents lived here from 1980 to 2005. I'm originally born in California, but I was raised in the Midwest. Yeah. And everything about me is very Midwest. But, you know, your body and your vibration and your family and your roots, they sit in your bones. And so for me, there was something that drew me to the ocean. I'm like, I really need to be here. And it's really a matter of slowing down my mind after many years of being on the road. You know, I was a single parent uh, raising a child on my own with special needs. And so my life was really put on halt, crea halt creatively for many, many years. And so when he was at a place where he was stable and I could kind of do my own thing, I did. And I just, it was like being shot out of a cannon. And um, those who have followed me on Instagram or um, are my friends and family, they know that I've really not slowed down since 2017. And things started to, kind of feel un unhinged in the last year as it was with everybody. But for me, it was like I went from a lockdown life to freedom, then back to lockdown. And so it created a lot of inner tension with me. And over the months, I would do month to month rentals. And so I was in the Carolinas for a while um, last winter. When I came here, um, I thought I, I, I need to breathe and really yeah. kneel the thing that I have found is that I'm learning to breathe again. I'm learning to kind of nurture myself again and just relax my mind and not be so anxious and think that the world is just going to pass me by after sitting in this holding pattern for so many years. As an artist, I've had a, a life riddled with jump starts. I'm going to quote you now, on aborted missions. I've ascended, I've flown, I've crashed, and I've burned so many times, often never even leaving the practical atmosphere. I, I, I'm a bit wearier today than I was at 23 when I first wandered off into the unknown to mend a broken heart with just my camera. It's very poetic. Uh, you are, you are, <laughs> you are, a, you are most definitely a writer and a photographer. And I'm wondering which one you you consider is is more you, the writing or the photography, or are they both married? Um, I call them my Siamese twins, right? <laughs> because you know I only have one child, so I don't know this experience to have two children and you know be like, well, which one? Do you favor one over the other? I'm like, I don't know, but I I, I have these other two loves of my life. Yeah. And they jockey. One requires more of my attention than the other, different types of attention. I struggle to actually post photos anymore without a backstory, mm. without some sort of uh, reflection. Because my writing is really reflective. It's slightly memoir. It's observational. It's whatever something you know my, my photography is my own writing craft. Yeah. let's talk about i mean your career start was in advertising and graphic design it was curtailed by the birth of your son um, as you've already said you had to spend longer with him for the special needs that he had uh, and so you you really put everything on hold didn't you Absolutely. I put everything on hold. My greatest love was building this graphic design business. I, I would wear myself out tired being so excited to go in to work every day. And I mean, I was just on fire and I loved it. And then it all just came to a screeching halt the minute my son was born and I had to leave it behind. And then his autism diagnosis a few years later, just really hammered it into the corner. And, uh, and I had to kind of sit on it. Mm. I, I spent my whole life working on getting him to adulthood. And I'm really happy to say that he is doing very well. And I'm on my own finally to pursue these artistic passions that just sat yeah. in this 
box. And I don't know anyone who's ever gone through, you know, 12 years of not being able to create. But I can tell you that when you come out of it, it's kind of like getting let out of prison. Yeah. It, it really, you feel a little bit feral is, a, is the only way I can describe it. And I had no designs on being a business person. I had no designs on selling anything, publish anything. I just wanted to create because I didn't get to create for so long. And, and that's a, a wonderful message for anyone who's coming back to photography or, or indeed wanting now to find a, a, a larger voice or do more, if you will, with their photography. And, and you know, uh, Miranda, this, this is somewhat of a more unusual interview, only, only in so much that I'm, I'm fascinated to talk with a photographer who's found their love for the medium once more after quite some time, well, actually having to say goodbye to it at one stage. So, so you're, you're in this wonderful location by the sea, and you're now in the stage of having made, across the last four years, a number of photo stories. I know that. Uh, and we'll come back to your travelling in a moment. So, so what is the project now? Is it, is it to piece all this experience together in some kind of volume now that you and photography and creativity are a, are a partnership again? Well, like I said, you know, I've just been creating yeah. and you're catching me at like, you know, um, I, I know a lot of the people that you, you talk to have have these great accomplishments yeah. behind them. I'm somebody who does not have that. Not yet. Not, in, not yet. Not, not yet. And so I'm still in the budding stage. And so I, I do want to get into a gallery. I would like to sell my work. I'm picking and choosing very carefully the people that I want to associate with that can push those dreams through and push those ideas through. I really want to publish a book or two or three. I don't know how it's going to pan out because I've been on the road so much that any one of the trips that I've taken on the road, this is not my first time at the rodeo. I've no. been traveling in my Jeep, which is called Thor, by the way. Oh, I, thought it was, uh, I thought it was called something else. I, I thought it was Jeepsy. Jeep, Jeepsy. Uh, Jeepsy is a play on my nickname as a kid. Ah, uh, apologies. Right. Uh, okay. my, my mom called me Gypsy when I was little, and uh. I just thought, wow, <laughs> Thor wasn't available, but Jeepsy was. So it was just okay. having a little fun with my yeah. childhood yeah. Um, dreams. Yeah. And I got in that Jeep, and I just traveled all over, and I, you know, if you go through my Instagram, you can see some of those travels. I do. I see it. I see it. So the, the stories that you collected while you were on your travels, these are yeah. these are the pictures that are going to – and your writings, this is what's going to form the, – these are the projects, aren't you? This is why yeah. you're in a house by by the sea putting – curating this all together. I hope so. I've never – I never set out with a goal. You know, I went out just to follow my gut. I have only traveled by following my instincts. I don't pick up a map and say, I'm going to go here, there, 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 and there. I've only done it one time, and that's when I drove to Alaska from Chicago. But by and large, the I'm a solo road traveler. I have been since I was 23. And each one of those times, I've followed my gut. i follow followed my instincts. I'll just get on the road. I've got 10 days. Maybe I only have a week. Maybe I only have three days. And I just – I get in the Jeep, I decide when I get to the interstate, okay, north, south, east, or west, and I just follow my gut. And, and I'm not kidding you when I tell you that that has been the best thing ever to just release myself from plans, release myself from an agenda, and just kind of let whatever the ethers are that guide us in this world, whatever you want to call them, they have taken me to some of the most amazing things, spiritual experiences. I've met so many amazing people, but just seeing this country, mm. I I love my country in in what it is as just an element of diverse landscape, you know, and Americana became a theme in my work that I didn't plan for. Mm. Um and taking the byways and the back roads, sure you can do that. But it's really more about stopping and paying attention to the things that most people are going to drive by. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's important to me is is kind of giving attention to the things that people normally walk by, myself included. I sometimes have to force myself to stop and say, wait a minute, that's interesting. 
give it some time. You have a, an interesting take on photographers and uh, photography and websites. You do have a website, and I know it's under fresh construction, but, uh, but really your website is unashamedly a social media platform, which is an interesting choice, but you say it suits you, and there is some method in this too. I, I, you know, you know I, I like a good bargain when it comes to getting your message out. I'm like, if it's free, yeah. if you're getting in, I mean, uh, clearly the audience is better than me trying to drag people off the street and like come to Miranda and, and people don't go there and I have to be logical and practical about well where is the audience I you know when I started off I had less than 300 followers and they were like 99% friends mm. so and all my growth has been organic I don't buy bots I don't I, I don't do any of that and what I love about Instagram is you know, it's kind of like, it's like the Ernest Hemingway school of writing. It, it forces you to choose your words, choose your narrative, choose your rise and fall, your beginning, your middle, your end, where are you going to climax your, your thought, where are you going to descend from it? Are you con- making connective tissue between the imagery that you put out there? Because we all know Instagram is put out there for, you know, visual arts mm. and it's become something, you know, it, it got let out of the barn. Mm. So for me, I know that when I started, everybody said, don't write on Instagram, nobody's going to read it. And that was 2016. And I thought, well, I know a few of my early followers would say, I come for the photos, I stay for the writing. Mm. And I knew that I was on to something. So I just said, you know what? If it's only one person that's staying for the writing, I'm just going to keep writing. And gradually, you know, more and more people have come along. And then just the topic of my photography has appealed on a global level because I think often it taps into that American myth. The American West is really prevalent because this is where I love to travel. But I need those parameters. I need someone to say, you only have this amount of space because it's forced me to be a better creative. And by parameters, I know from a conversation prior to this, we, we were talking about having that uh, that 2200 character limit, which which really, I, I guess, makes you a writer, a subby, an editor in one. But but um, but I'm writing that on the board, you know, they, they came for the pictures, they stay for the writing. Do you, do you think people miss a trip by not writing more? Because this is something Valerie Chardin touched on too. And, and not just Valerie, it seems to be a theme my guests have been mentioning more of late. Do, do photographers miss a trip by not writing more or, or at least writing with humanity and, and, and purpose? Yes. I think one, you know, and this is just my personal opinion. And by by I, writing know, more, by the way, I don't mean just putting hashtags on. I mean, actually, actually I really connecting. get, as a, I'm a consumer of photography. I am a, the biggest fan of imagery and art that, that there is. I'm not just, you know, interested in my own stuff. I'm fascinated where people go and what they see and do. Yeah. And I'll tell you, if people aren't tagging their location, I kind of go a little crazy. I want a backstory. I'm like, well, this is a pr- this is pretty. Well, what does it mean to you? So often, I feel like people are like there are a lot more touristy photos out there than I think people really intend. Mm. And even by, by really, really, you know, wonderful photographers, even because I I think photo- sometimes maybe photographers who don't write feel like, well, what can I say about this? I'm not a writer. I'm like, well, when I started out, I wasn't a photographer. I didn't consider myself a photographer in 2016. Mm. I considered myself more of a writer. And now I really am the scales of balanced. I, I don't know which is better. Everyone has their own opinion, what, what they like. Mm. I just follow what I need. I would love to see photographers have more of a narrative. Don't And, and not not tell me what it is that you're doing, but show me what it means to you. Because I think we need more sensation. You know, I'm all about the tactile world. What what do I feel? What do I sense? Am I, is it bringing me back to a happy memory? Is it bringing me back to a sad thing? Is it making me reflective? You know, I like storytelling Mm -hmm. and not just the visual kind, but the the literary kind, because, you know, we need that. Mm -hmm. And we're so hyper-visual right now. and, And it's a wonderful time to be an image creator. But the writing is so much falling behind. And I think every photographer has an interesting life. And I really would love to hear more 
about what they do because I'm I'm a student of everyone that I encounter. Yeah, I just am. I always will be. Yeah, and I, I think as photographers we are, aren't we? I, I certainly learned so much from engaging with photographers, no matter what their skill or, or indeed sometimes notoriety. And it's it's fuel to my more inquisitive nature talking with a photographer, Miranda, who's absolutely loving finding the medium, which is a which is a, a bit of a theme today. So. So having been out for so long, lit the creative fire, so to speak, and, and finding your photographic and, and writing voice once more, what, what, what does it mean to you? It's everything. Mm. If, if it wasn't derailed for a while, and I get really emotional talking well, about it. I can it, tell, I can tell. I don't take it for granted. I'm, I'm not young anymore. I'm middle-aged. It could, it, you know, I have more yesterdays than tomorrow's and I look at it and I think I feel things I've been a mother of experienced life and it 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 bleeds into my work it affects how I see the world it affects what I want to say it affects because if you go through enough things you can't not come out the other side having more senses more sensation more empathy more calm in some regards yeah. about the world. And I I was a high, strong, anxious young woman. Mm. And, you know, that parts of that never really disappeared. That is really the thing is I don't think I would have ever appreciated it like I do now. One of my favorite books of all time uh, was written by Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I don't know whether you've ever heard of that book, but the most important two words in that book, and perhaps the universe actually, were don't panic. It seems to me that what you say to fellow creatives is don't plan. I, I'm an instinct driven person. Yeah. And, and, and uh, what I, what I kind of going back to the Instagram thing, when you're given constrictions, like I've given myself one lens, yeah. one camera, one vehicle, a limited amount of resources to travel around, you are forced to create something out of necessity. Yes, yes. And so you don't have enough time to plan. You don't have enough. Like if you, I don't, I'm not encouraging people to fly by the seat of their pants and quit their job and go on the road. It's not for everybody. I know people who think that's really romantic, but you've got to be wired a certain way to do what I do. And I'm not saying I'm better than anyone. I'm just saying I get anxious too. I get anxious on the road. I've made some split decisions and I kind of went, mm, maybe I should have pulled off and stayed at a hotel at the, like, <laughs> the last town. But those creative decisions that come out of constriction, it's, you know, it's kind of boils down to necessity as a mother of invention. Yeah. And that's something, if you want to say, don't plan plans get blown out of the water any you know i don't like making plans because they just don't work out for me you know maybe other people are fabulously successful making plans and and can do that it's just not been something that's worked out particularly well in my instance but i even if it's not something that you do 24 7 even if you're not the person who can just wake up you wipe the sleep out of your eyes and get in your jeep grab a coffee and go on the road for eight hours and with no idea where you're going to end up and then just turn around at hour six and drive back home which is what i do if you do it once just try it once i i just think you will figure out some things about yourself that you never knew before there's a lot to be said about that kind of activity it's it's playing it's adult playing we don't we don't get to be surprised too much the older we get but that's one way you can is to not make a plan Miranda Remington uh, fantastic to speak with her about um well, her forthcoming projects and uh, and a book, who knows? And I'll keep up to date with Miranda and stay in touch with her. And, of course, you can as well by uh, going to her Instagram. The new website that she's got, or the website is, is under, under new construction. That's what I meant to say. But um, as you heard, Insta is really, really Miranda's hangout. And in some respects, there's no reason why it can't be her website at the same time. Um, welcome to the Friday Photo Walk. Oh, I've been with you all the time, Neil. What do you mean, welcome? Well, just in case 
You don't really tune in halfway through a podcast, do you? It's not like radio. Some of those old habits from my radio days where, you know, somebody hasn't been with you for the first half of the show, then suddenly they are. Um, But uh, this is the Friday Photo Walk. I do believe it's the only photo walk show of its kind. Yes, there may be other walks that people do, but um, the way that it's put together, with help from you, our community, the uh, fantastic emails and thoughts and questions that you send in, the talking points which are, are so very precious, and uh, I'm completely lost, by the way. Where am I? Oh, well, I'll just keep talking to you. Often when I talk to you, I seem to find my way. You have a magical way of guiding me without even knowing it. Yes, and your, your thoughts of inspiration, just keep sending them into studio at photographydaily.show. Lots of exciting things to come on this, uh, on this podcast. We, we started to chat a couple of weeks ago, didn't we, about the, um, the photo walk retreat which is, which is, he says, crossing his fingers. I go through, look, I'm going to level with you. I'm going through sort of various thoughts about the retreat at the moment. I really want to do it in February. Um, but there always has to be a but in this COVID world, doesn't there? And it is about COVID. Part of me is thinking, you know, what if COVID sort of runs a sort of runs through it and I can't attend uh, yeah, not that I'm special, but it, it is what, what we're doing is kind of a, you know, I, I, like to, I like to feel that I'm an important part of it. Yeah, or, or for some reason the venue be, closed down because of, I don't know. All these things that are running through my mind, but I should just say, look, to hell with it. Let's just do it, shouldn't I? Yes, you should, Neil. Yeah, I probably should, shouldn't I? Yes, I'm telling you, just do it. Anyway, talking about Instagram a moment ago, here's, uh, here's a link to go visit from our patron of the day. At Ruveng is his uh, Instagram. R-U-V-E-N-G is one of our m- more recent patrons. And um, I have a message from him in terms of the, the meaning of story in a moment, which is a subject that does seem to run and run, doesn't it? That word story. And whether we, in fact, um, overuse it. But go visit his Instagram. I'll leave a link on the show page as ever. And I picked out a couple of images from from all the fabulous street work that you've done, Reuven. Um, First one was a a layers picture in black and white that you posted uh, not so long back, actually, 8th of October, where you you shot through the legs of, of a silhouetted walker on a beach. But you've shot through in such a way that there's somebody behind, well, through those legs in the distance walking in well i assume they're walking in it looks like it they're walking into the shop very clever very good and then there was another from a, a lot earlier back as you were learning to live i think you moved to la didn't you? you you were learning to live in your your new la surroundings by the looks of it the the aircraft flying directly overhead at say i don't know one or one or two hundred feet certainly not that much more, perhaps, perhaps just a tad more. The way you positioned yourself under the approach lights, looking up, very clever. And, um, and your writing in the piece, of course, that goes hand in hand um, today with, uh, with our, our guest, Miranda. What did she say? I came for the pictures, I stayed for the writing. Oh, love that. Um, so, but let me read what you, what you wrote. There are four runways at LAX, says Reuven. And they're all parallel to each other. And the planes always land from the east and take off to the west. As I work to get comfortable in my new home, I try to navigate as much as possible without using GPS so I can actually learn the streets and not just blindly follow Siri's voice. I find that the non-stop flow of planes into and out of LAX to be oddly reassuring. When I think, uh, turn left or turn right here, I just look up, see some planes then I know the way to go. Wonderful. Fantastic. Um, I know you don't write on all of your pieces, but you certainly have a talent for that as well. So thank you. That's our patron of the day today. And from the price of one high street coffee per month, patrons are so important. I know I say this week after week, but they really are to um, helping maintain a future for this podcast and helping us to grow it because... Um, I know that uh, there are so many plans that I want to do with you, but there's only so many, so many days in the week that you can really uh, commit yourself to something. Um, unless, unless it's much more of your life. 
So thank you, patrons. There's an edition every Saturday with uh, extra pop-ups every whenever for our patrons. They get to hear diary pieces, um, sometimes excerpts, longer excerpts and from uh, interviews that uh, otherwise aren't aired on the free stream. And, of course, we meet once a month on Zoom, small collective of us, so we can have a chat, show some of our work and just pass the time, some with a coffee, some with something slightly, slightly weightier. So, uh, so yes, double bubble for Reuven here because um, I'm sticking with you for a comment that you made on our show page comments on the subject of storytelling. Um, j- just so you know, if you didn't hear, we did quite a sizable piece on, it was last week, wasn't it, on, w- on whether the word story has been somewhat hi- hijacked by those who, who use it when posting a picture of, um, I don't know, a, a hamburger or something equally inanimate that kind of thing so Reuven said uh, I've had this storytelling conversation with friends during photo walks and what we concluded he says is that people get confused about what story means it's not that the image itself has a narrative but rather that you can impose a narrative of your own on the image A strong storytelling picture is one where the story you impose is clear and obvious. Most observers will tell themselves the same story. Equally, or maybe even better, a storytelling picture is one where it feels like there's a strong and obvious story, but different observers disagree, or maybe agree, on what that story is. But any image, any image, says Reuven, can have a story imposed on it, even if it's just about the photographer's effort to get to a location or what the weather was doing on the day. And you're absolutely right, I suppose. Reuven, that's, that's the reason. I have a, an A4 sheet of paper that I take to all events, and it's mainly weddings, as you know, that, that I photograph. And uh, on the top of that paper at the moment, if you were to grab that piece of paper, underneath you'd see some of the some of the group portraits that have been asked for just so that nothing's forgotten if there's any important detail that i should know about anybody in particular at the wedding anybody particularly precious that um, that the couple want to make sure is photographed and 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 but at the top at the very top and of course a result of uh, my dear late photographer friend steve shipman um, i have well it used to say look up he used to say look up because that's what Steve said, wasn't it? Always look up. Get a picture of what's above you. But now it says, it just says the sky. And I make sure that I photograph the sky of the day because that, here we go, tells a story of the day, does it not? Was it cloudy? Was it rainy? Was it, you know, a deep blue lush sky? Could I grab the tripod from the, um, from the car and do a a long exposure to show movements in the clouds, all those sort of things. That, that, um, that sky picture now has become something that I, I make sure I, I get. Sometime, sometimes I don't read the top of that paper and I kick myself for it later on when I'm thinking, story, Neil, story. Anyway, Reuben says, I very much enjoy the podcast, Neil, especially when you talk to yourself with different voices. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good thing, is it? It's not always different voices, Reuven. Sometimes I'm just disagreeing with myself in the same voice. Uh, it reminds me of Ricky Gervais in The Office, except he says you're not an idiot. <laughs> I, I assume you're saying that with, um, with, 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 a, with a modicum of uh, irony. Is irony the right word? Uh, Rick, I tell you what, that, that, uh, what was that? What was that? Pro- not The Office. What was the programme called? Um, Oh, it was all about uh, when he's... uh, I'm not going to sell this very well, but uh, when um, his partner had passed away. Oh, it was a beautiful, beautiful programme. And I saw Ricky acting in an entirely... uh, There were moments, there were flashes of The Office, but generally um, I saw a very different Ricky Gervais. And um, I know people say sometimes he has one act. Uh Not true, not true. But also, um, Reuven says, I've started my own weekly photo walk as a project. You see, a photo walk is a project in itself. I want to spend the next year taking pictures of the 16 beaches operated by Los Angeles County. I'll post some in the Facebook group. Make sure you do. And please, send some in for the 365. Um, And also, let's have some photo walk pictures from you as well so we can follow you. So this uh, this word story, you've got me thinking again oh no Neil um, 
it, it is the story that um, that we make in our own minds when we look at a picture. You're absolutely right. Not always something obvious that the picture is telling us, but uh, but what we narrate from the experience, I, I suppose, of of seeing that uh, that picture. I almost feel like saying, "Case closed now," um, as as the TV detective Columbo might say. But as in the uh, the greatest tradition, we're mentioning Columbo. Just one more thing. Just one more thing. Um, and my one more thing is going to come in the form of uh, an inspirational moment as we do on these shows, play some former guests to you. The photographer now is, is this is Scott Goldsmith, uh, a photojournalist, very good photojournalist, very respected photojournalist, who, who talks about the story here, and one in particular that he's been working on and thinking about. One of the stories I'm working on that um, might come to light pretty soon started uh, in Cleveland with the, one of the smallest premature babies that had ever been born that was gonna live and people that are born extremely premature don't usually have some kind of problems. But So I got to know this inner city, unfortunately, a very poverty stricken family pretty well during that period of time. And you know, as luck would have it, was able to enter their lives in some way and they accepted me with a camera. And then I decided to take off like 15 years or 20 years and revisit that family. And the goal was to see how a struggling inner city family would change with the next generation or maybe not. And sadly enough, they didn't, you know, that some of the same problems were coming. The, the kids that I knew now had kids of their own. One was killed in a drug deal. One was in prison. So I'm, I'm now at the phase where I'm trying to go back and revisit that and show how difficult it is to get out of that lifestyle. And so how important things are, like a minimum wage of $15, which they're talking about in the US Congress now, how important that is to families like this who are just eking by, you know, working at McDonald's, making way below $15 an hour. So that's the story. And the story hopefully points to how difficult that is. And I think as photojournalists, we can, we can maybe have an influence on legislation that could help those people. Scott Goldsmith. Right, before we meet our, our second guest, who you'll hear across the next two weeks in two chapters. Um, I, I have some quick fire round pictures from the, from around the world where you've been making your walks, and I'll, I'll share these, of course, on the uh, on the show page. Uh, starting with Ivan Kreeth, uh, walking in Oklahoma as opposed to Memphis. Oh, we're back on that song, walking in Oklahoma. No, it didn't. It didn't scan. I I entirely understand why you chose Memphis. Uh, hello, Neil. Here are a few photos from a photo walk with my wife, Mary, who was looking for sand plums. I assume by that you mean the colour, not looking in the sand for them. This is in northeast Oklahoma near a town called Ramona. My wife makes jelly with the sand plums. Sounds nice. Sand plums grow on trees. Oh, there we go. There's my answer. In southeast um, United States, from Oklahoma to Florida. Hope this finds you well. Keep your powder dry and protect your top knot. I would but um, I can't stand ties. You know, if I could, I would wear a tee to a wedding. I really would. And, um, oh, by the way, I must just say, your description on your Instagram account, uh, which I'm linking to, I am, I'm, what's the word, I, the expression? I'm wonderfully flawed by it, in a nice way. Get this, stand by, you'll like this. He writes, my photography is the poetry I wish I could write. Oh, I want to make a bumper sticker of that. Or T-shirts. God, I'd even go as far as making a sunstrip on the, uh, on the windscreen with car. No, you won't. No, I think the last one I made, to be fair, car was probably, probably in the, the 80s. You can, you can breathe a, a sigh of relief there. I will put those pictures today of your Oklahoma walk on the, uh, on the show page. Here's one from Christine Bird. Hi, Neil. I had a photo walk around our hometown of Ramsgate to the main sands and a view of the construction of Royal Sands luxury beachfront apartments and the Grade 2 listed Royal Pavilion, now apparently the largest weather spoons in the world. Now, um, for those that live in, in countries that are not the UK, do you, have them, do you have weather spoons in Ireland as well? But I don't think I've seen weather spoons anywhere else. You're joking, Neil. They're all over the world. Really? I don't think so. 
But just so you know, weather, weather spoons is, um, it's, uh, it's like a, well, it's a big pub. And it's modelled to look like a traditional English pub. And I've eaten and, and um, had some nights out in, in weather spoons. But I, I think it'd be fair to say it wouldn't be the traditional pub that I see as um, the... Um, <laughs> try not to get myself in trouble here. Look, as the pub I'd really want to spend time in with my mates. It's loud, it's brash, and that's what it's designed for mostly. Not always, but <laughs> that seems... To, it's a meeting place for people when they just want to have a good time. Is that fair? It's my personal opinion. Um, but uh, yeah, but Weatherspoons, it's also, um, it's also one of these places where you can have a sort of late alcohol-based breakfast in the morning. It operates on what, what I loosely call airport time. You know when you go to an airport where you can drink any time of the day or night? You know, somebody says, shall we have a beer? And you'll say, look, it's 7.30 in the morning. Well, it doesn't matter. It's airport time. Oh, I suppose so. OK. Uh, sorry, Christine, where were we? Uh, yes, so the, the weather spoons. Uh, anyways, uh, Christine also made pictures of the large... Um, is it a T Vega schooner being repaired in the harbour, helping frame a lighthouse in the background, which was beautifully done? Then she said, up to the west cliff for softer views of the sea through wildflowers and trees. And I'm assuming you didn't have your, your liquid lunch in weather spoons, no? Perfect, anyway, the, the photo walk pictures that you made. I'm going to call this uh, a very a very late... Uh, Indian summer. The pictures look far too sunny to be to be now. We know they were taken a, just a short while back, weren't they? But uh, I love to see where you've been walking. We'll pop those up on the show page today. So we're off to Brazil in a moment. But um, a mention first for Harry Jenkinson, a uh, Jenkinson who wrote in Jenkinson. Sorry, not Jenkinson. Jenkinson, who wrote in about this thing that is a constant here at the moment: posting for posting's sake. I promised we'd talk about this. Hello, Neil. I just want to throw my thoughts in on this one since I've uh, come off all platforms uh, right now. I got caught up with having to post in case I got left behind by the, by the algorithm. Now, you might forgive me if I were in my teens, perhaps. Now, that's another conversation in itself. But um, I'm 38. It's got to the stage where it was uh, the first and last thing I thought about each day. But having time away has let me think about the importance of posting only when I feel like it. And if that's weeks or even a month apart, who cares? Who really cares? I'll be coming back to it, as I do like to share my work, but in future I'll be happy with a handful of comments that I engage with rather than thinking about the L word. I assume you mean likes. Keep up the good work. Yes, it was a, do you know, I had a private conversation with, uh, with Miranda Remington, our fir- first guest today. Um, we, we exchanged a, a few messages after the interview, just having a chat. And, and one of those messages, um, we talked about, you know, you'd, you'd be absolutely delighted. If you were in a room and, um, and 50, look, 50 likes for some photographers is, is not enough. Is that, what have I done wrong? Where did I go wrong? But actually, if you had 50 people sat in front of you on chairs all wanting to ask you a question about that one image, you would be delighted. Likewise, if when it comes to comments, you have five or 10, I don't know, people that want to engage and ask you about the picture, what you were thinking and what it means to you, then, um, yeah, the same thing. If you have five or ten people in front of you in a pub, maybe even in a Weatherspoons, you'd think, yeah, do you know, fantastic. So, yeah, bear in mind, likes and comments. If, uh, if you're in the real world, then uh, just, a, just a few people around you that really care about what you do means so much more than multi, multi, multi other people that you, you can't see, don't know, and uh, are just swiping on by rather briskly. Right, I have a feeling that subject anyway will roll more and more, a lot more. But for the moment today, I want to take you away from here, well away to where the, the light sound of samba can be heard above the surf, where, where you're never far from a football, it would seem. Home place to my next guest, whose story I will share in two parts across the next two weeks. Sandra Catania Ordorno started photographing by complete accident in her 60s. And uh, she uh, already she's now, well, she's internationally published. 
which has done many things for creatively and personally and, and of course now by extension of that being published professionally I said we'd inspire you today and I hope you, you'll agree that this certainly fits the bill Sandra, your story starts in a, in a very international way, doesn't it? With time even spent in the UK studying. But how, how come the moves and, uh, and the moves over great distances too? Okay, my mother was English and um, my father Portuguese right. with French. Grandparents were Swiss. Right. And so they met in Brazil. Ah. And so they began to live in Brazil, but they wanted us, all three of us children, to leave Brazil to come to Europe. So when I was 12, the end of my 12th year, uh, they sent me to a boarding school in Surrey, Weybridge. It was a nun school, doesn't exist anymore, Roslyn House. Right. And so I stayed there at that time. It was called the finishing school. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. to learn manners. <laughs> Such a funny thing to have existed. Please, Just please don't tell how, me they, they were doing deportment where they made you carry books on your head and walk upright. Yes, and really? cross your legs and how ah. to get out of a car, you know, all these yeah. things. It's such a funny world because yeah. that's so a hundred years ago, but it was in my lifetime. Yeah. So, but it was, there was a wonderful thing about that school was that every weekend they took us to see the most amazing things, ballets, plays, concerts. So I had an amazing culture that I would never have had if I had stayed in Brazil. So you were born in Rio, um, yeah. studied in the UK. You speak about a dozen, probably two dozen languages, to be honest, <laughs> with all, all that traveling you've, you've described. Um, it, I mean, it, it is a life experience of different cultures that's probably food for your creativity now, isn't it? I think so. I think it seemed it was, yes, I went to university in the States. Yeah. Then I went to live in Argentina where there were bombs going around. Then I went to live in Paraguay, which was another incredible experience. Mm. So I think all this, yes, it's um, observing other cultures and trying to understand other cultures. But I never knew that this would be useful hmm. in my life. You know, you don't know. Well, I have a complete soft centre for stories of those who find a passion, a skill or vocation in something uh, when they are when they are of more um, experienced years. And you are, you are a complete success story here, coming to photography <laughs> at age 60 with an eye to attract publishers in their work. But, but you had no experience before. I mean, you picked up a camera, I'm sure, as to take some I had snaps, that but... little camera, that Sony smart camera, you right. know, that little one, a silver little thing. That's the only thing. I never took pictures in my life. Not even in your childhood? Oh, never, never, never. I wasn't interested. I had no idea. I was very exposed to pictures and sculptures, museums, yes, a lot. Yeah. But no photography. I knew the name of no one. And I never was interested. It was my daughter who told me, come with me. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go to a workshop. I said, what? <laughs> and she took you to this workshop with Alex Webb and Alex and Rebecca Webb. And that, that was the start yeah. of it all, wasn't it? Not a bad yeah. workshop to be the start of it all, I might No, add. she gave me as a gift. I gave her the hotel that we stayed in and she gave me as a gift the workshop. Yeah. And I said, yeah, but what gift is this? <laughs> because it was my 60th birthday. So, so, but how can this be a gift? It's a torture. <laughs> I have no idea what to do. But it was one, look, I have to say, I was so bad, so, so, so bad. And I have no idea how Alex and Rebecca had the patience <laughs> for the horrible pictures that I took. You know? It was all blurred, out of focus, upside down. But for some reason, they were very kind. Yeah. Do you, do you think it is an advantage then finding a creative outlet in, in our more experienced years, as I'm now going to call them, in that we have all this life experience, this travelling, this nomadic lifestyle in, in your case? Yes, I think there is uh, an advantage. Not only that, everything that is stored in the brain, like all the pictures you saw, all the yeah. things, beautiful things you saw, that are in a way stored in the brain, and they come out. I, I Sometimes I do a picture and I say, ah, 
It reminds me of this that I saw, I don't know where or when. The only thing that is bad about being older is that you have to accelerate the process mm. because you, you don't have the luxury of staying, you know, six years to do a book. You don't have those years. Mm. You have to go quickly. So I'm, I'm doing my third book I know. that is coming out yeah. next year because I know that I don't have the luxury of time. Mm. That's the thing that you don't have. But life has opened up for you in a, in a Phoenix-like way, hasn't it, finding photography? You, you're back on aeroplanes when you can be. You're striding out with a very new and exciting purpose, aren't you? It's amazing. It's the greatest gift that I could ever. Yeah. And, and without even expecting it at 60 yeah. and it's easy i just get the camera and go everywhere with it i could have died without finding out yeah. so all of us maybe have something that we if we don't explore we won't find out no no I, uh, for, for many years personally sandra i i felt like a visitor myself coming to this as a second occupation uh, photography that is and I, i've heard you I've heard you express with a, a degree of surprise when the, when the label photographer is mentioned that you are one. Do, do you feel like a photographer now? Do you, do, you yeah. label, do you label yourself a photographer at last? Mm. You know why? Because I'm not technical. Mm. I didn't go to school. So I, if I do a picture today and it's a great picture, I cannot, re- <laughs> if I want to do it again, <laughs> I don't know what I did. And it's it's horrible because I say I don't have the the technical skills because I didn't study and I don't have time. If I go into that, I don't have time to do the rest. So I'm relying only in having fun and going with my eye. But as a photographer, I'm not complete because I don't have the technical skills. I'm really bad at them. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I know that the technical side doesn't really interest you. And speaking with the street photographer Valerie Jardin, with all her decades of experience, she suggested that this this just wasn't the side that she was interested in entirely, or not everybody is interested in entirely. What what feeds yeah. your eye is what you feel. Yeah, what I feel, what I see, and that's what makes me happy. There's no use of me seeing something and then losing it. I mean, I prefer not to lose it, so I go for yeah. the quickest way I can get. The only thing, I'm, I can't have a technical discussion with anyone because... Mm. I'm not that person. But you're a prolific shooter. I would imagine watching you work must be fascinating because you can come back with a thousand pictures where the rest of us are thinking, what can I photograph? And taking, you know, an, an awful lot of time to think about each each composition. Oh, my God. It's an enormous amount of pictures. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Enormous amount of pictures. And I'm, thank God we're in the digital <laughs> era and I can throw them away. But it's a lot of work. I stay until three, four in the morning editing because yeah. next day I know there's another thousand or two thousand. This is the, this has become like a a daily project for you now, hasn't it? Get yeah. out there Every, with a camera. Light Every up, day. out. Light up, out again. That has been the case for the last four years. In the beginning, no. In the beginning, I only went out when I was on holiday yeah. and, and not every day. Now it's every day. I have it here. My bag is there. The camera is there. Yeah. And every day I come back with something and every day I need to edit. If not, if I accumulate, I'm dead. <laughs> I'm going to talk about your book in a moment, but I, I would like to know, do you wish you'd have taken that workshop earlier? I know you've been asked this question. Oh, before. yes, I wish. I. You know why? Why? Because I feel that if I had been younger, I would have experimented more and invented more. And that's what I think is fascinating with photography that's for me what makes me it's if i see something new uh, a reflection or something and if i younger i would have had more my mind would have been more open to that so your latest book aguash duro tell me about that i i do want to get to the tactile nature of the book and the way it's presented but photographically what's the story because it is so much more than pictures of people at play and living a beach life it, it seems to me it's a bit of a love story to a country and people. It is a love story to my country, yes. And going back to where I had a very nice childhood and it was many, many days in on the beach with my parents and friends. But apart from that, it's also, I think, that, you know, Brazil, you always see when you talk about Brazil, it's there's 
people pinpoint, you know, all the misery, all the poverty, all the struggles, which are completely true. But I didn't want to go there. I wanted to have my Brazil, a happier Brazil, happier people. The beach costs zero. Yeah. They can go there for nothing. They can have fun. They are smiling. They have family smiling. And that's what I wanted to depict because the other side is the side that I don't like and hurts me very much, the other side of Brazil. So I didn't want to go there. I wanted to go to the happy Brazil. So it's a funny thing because I had a friend who made a book and came out at the same time as mine and hers (laughs) was such a sad Brazil. (laughs) Am I such a happy Brazil? But it's the same country seen in different ways. And it's football in the, the shadow of Sugarloaf Mountain, really, isn't it? I mean, it's it's joy, it's fun, it's playful. It's playful. And that's the part that I wanted to show. Uh, because uh, the other one is a tough, tough reality. Yeah. But you describe so poignantly landing in a plane in Rio, those fellow passengers around you crying at the sight of the beach and the bay, which is... Which is something I don't think I've ever heard before. I've certainly not experienced. Is that what it's really like when people come back? When I was young, when I came back, I was coming back from London, yeah. you know, for my holidays in Brazil. You no, know, they did something that no one would have done today with, you know, efficiency of fuel and everything. Yeah. They surrounded the Bay of Rio and they put this amazing song. But they went, you know, going, no one would waste fuel nowadays doing that for the passengers to look at the bay yeah, yeah. and uh, and then everyone was so it's it was so beautiful it was so amazing so they played a song on the airliner as you were as you were circling yes and they said we're going to circle the bay for you to enjoy it and then they circled and with the song oh, wow <laughs> It's something of another era. It doesn't happen. Oh, it will that's... never happen again. All right, that's uh, Roll Out the Barrel is certainly a song I've not uh, not heard when we're doing laps of honour around Heathrow Airport. Maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's something they should think about. Only when you cannot land at Heathrow. <laughs> then you have to do laps. But you don't see anything. There's fog. <laughs> yeah. So you, you shot this... Uh, I know you're Rio born, as we've discussed. You have a strong affinity with this place and the people. You could have shot, shot a book like this on any other beach? Probably not. Could you, as a photographer, can you can you transpose your sincere love of one canvas onto another? I suspect you're going to say no. It had to be Rio. It had to be Rio, and it was important for it to be Rio. And I interacted with the people on the beach, and I had many very good experiences. You know, it was very nice to go back and and feel. Everything that, you know, there are many things that reminded me when I was small, little girls playing with the ball and uh, picnics, because when I was a child, there were very few people in the beach. And so, I mean, it's a completely different beach nowadays, but the the, the atmosphere was there. There's always music. There's always, it's, it's a lot of fun. Sandra Catania Ordorno. My thanks to both our special guests this week, Sandra, uh, just there, and uh, earlier, of course, Miranda Remington. Sandra returns next week, and uh, for patrons, Miranda is going to be back a little more uh, for for your ears only. I uh, I want to mention before we we play out this week with a with a record which from your messages you're quite liking now as part of the show. So I'm going to keep that feature going. But uh, let me mention Jost Gerritsen. Last year, Neil, says, uh, Jost, I I sent you some photos of a caravan and other things I'd encountered near where I live in Spain. And you very kindly featured me in one of your shows. I remember the pictures that you were making. Um, Yeah, I remember that mail. The things that you were finding along your trail as as you walked... Uh, I also mentioned that I was part of a, a, an art group of people working in different disciplines in art, sculpture and, and painting, uh, poetry and photography. We're all inspired by the things we come across during our, our walks, whether this be mudlarking, mudlarking, what a great expression, along the Thames in England, city scenes elsewhere in the world or the countryside in places like Spain. 
This year, we're finally able to organise a proper exhibition in the APT Gallery in London, which we're very excited about. There's also a collaboration with a local school and there's uh, a part of the exhibition, now this is clever actually, reserved for people visiting to participate and show their work inspired by the idea of the exhibition. And there's a, there seems to, there's a printer at hand so that you can print photos on the spot. Isn't that a great idea? So you go to an exhibition, you feel part of it, you create work because of it, and then they print it out and use it. That's a fantastic idea. So the, um, the private view was last night. Um, so if you're listening to this on the day of release, <laughs> it was last night. And uh, oh, I wish I could have gone, but I wasn't able to. But um, the show goes on at the APT in London. And uh, it lasts until the 30th, so there's a week to go. So there we go, a mention for the show. Although the, those that are saying, uh, excuse me, Neil, I live in the Ukraine and I have to be home each day by tea time for goulash and chips. Do we, I know that's hungry, goulash and chips, isn't it? I don't think the chips part is hungry, but... Uh, so I can't, I can't actually nip out to that today. Well, for you, uh, there is handily an Instagram account, which is at ground underscore work underscore APT. Um, I will put the link, of course, on the show page. It's a, a collective account from the artists involved. So it means wherever you are in the world, even somewhere where you're more likely to eat goulash and chips, you can see a, a little piece of this right now. So thank you, Jost. And a link, as I say, will be on the show page today. So we're playing out with a song called The Best Thing, which is, uh, I think, uh, when I choose these songs, by the way, for, for the playouts on the on the podcast each week. I, I try to think of something that, that, that I would photo walk to, something which is, that they are generally going to be slightly slower in pace because I like to take my photo walks and think about stuff so they're so slightly more thoughtful than, uh, I don't know, I don't know why a, a, a quick step banjo and a country song is coming to mind, but you know what I mean. So they tend to, to follow that kind, of, um, that kind of pace. And I like this because it's a, a sort of a short kind of into the sunset folk number. This is uh, Paper Planes with a song called The Best Thing. Rainy days don't seem so wet Stormy nights don't stay From the moment that we met You're worth the wait Oh this could be the best thing that I'll ever know mm -hmm. Talked for hours and never slept Two silhouettes on the concrete steps We watched the sun as it slowly crept from the horizon to the place we met Oh, this could be the best thing that I'll ever know Paper planes, and that's it for this week. My thanks to our guests, Miranda Remington and Sandra Catania Odorno, who returns next week for more on her incredible story of finding photography and making every day count with a camera. Photography made me look around me, made me see people, made me pay attention to interactions, to the eyes of people, to to everything. It, it's a different world that I now have that I didn't and I would have died without knowing it. My thanks to, to those who are my patrons. I feel very personally blessed to have you lot. We talk about gratitude on this show and I genuinely feel that when I engage with you 
in the Patreon area. And so tomorrow in the more show, for your ears only, in the special player that you have access to, we talk, funnily enough, about gratitude in the diary piece. And, uh, and what the olds say, careful, Neil, my photographer, dentist and book club is, uh, well, it's Being English by Patrick Ward. If you want to join us on that and you're not a member, look for the link on the website that says support the show. Music today from the incredible artlist.io and I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you next time. Now that the, uh, as you can hear, the squelching underfoot. Here we go. Now that winter is, um, winter is bearing down upon us, I expect to get the wrath of car just like last year. Oh, you heard that? I know you did. Did you read, by the way, the mail from Eric? I did. I made it the first one of the show this week. I remember him emailing in last year. Oh, you remember that one as well, do you? Yep, I do. And the story's a happy one. I know, you like happy stories, don't you? You're a bit Disney, aren't you, Carl? Yeah, very Disney. You probably wouldn't like what we're watching each evening, then. What's that? Well, Jack, our Jack has uh, gotten into Stranger Things. I know Stranger Things was on a few years back now, but uh, he's at last old enough to watch it. Is it frightening? Yeah, it is, actually. Yeah. And I must admit, walking in the woods today, and I'm pleased to see you, um, <laughs> there were moments when it was a bit darker and it was a bit deeper in the woods. I was thinking, hang on, this is a bit like a scene from Stranger Things. If I start seeing things floating down from above me, I'm running. Let's be heading back before this world turns into the upside down. Right, engine started. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.